Well, I recently went on a long road trip across Montana. And like every road trip across Montana, there were stretches of the highway which were under road construction. As the saying here goes, there are two seasons, winter and road construction. Montana is about as sparsely populated as Mongolia and has similar weather. <laughs> but the thing is, it's a lot more prosperous. Essentially, if you think about it, it's an archipelago of small towns scattered across mountain chains. With highways, which are paid for by the federal government, linking them together. If the federal government dissolved the way that the federal government of the Soviet Union dissolved, for example, you couldn't pay for these roads, and that archipelago would dry up and become a handful of isolated communities. Those nice asphalt highways and interstates would deteriorate into mucky dirt roads, sometimes utterly impassable during parts of fall and spring. If you ever bring this fact up to most Montanans, they'll just shrug or laugh it off at you. People don't understand the frailty of the system, and even in the wake of the coronavirus, in its consequences, the inherent frailty of the modern world is scarcely realized. The corona crisis, as it stands now, if it were to end completely, and there is no resurgent virus, uh, it will lead to light, lingering shortages throughout the year and to next year. And, you know, there's going to be an energy crisis. There's going to be consolidation of gas and, and uh, oil companies. And, you know, there's another economic recession, which is going to be as bad as 2008. And millennials essentially now are a lost generation. Before the shutdowns and the stay-at-home orders were put in place... You really, I didn't see it at the scale, or I'd never perceived how it really worked at a scale, because I was too young during major events before that occurred to my nation. People acted as a mass group, and they didn't really examine the threat, or say, if you're one of those deniers, the lack of a threat in any real detail. The truth is, people really are NPCs. So, if the coronavirus crisis ends now, there's no second wave, there's no nothing, you know, it was, it was a tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of old people died, and that was it. It was just a more aggressive, just the flu bro, and it led to a recession, right? This whole fiasco should illustrate to the world that we live in, the neoliberal world order, is very, very fragile. And the vast majority of people don't understand this and indeed are incapable of understanding this. And they will not take any action to mediate, mitigate this, fra this frailty. Why, in day-to-day -day life, the United States and the neoliberal world appears secure, the reality is that it simply is not. Boomers may think that the handmaiden's tale, those liberal boomers, and conservative boomers may believe that Obama's Muslim socialism is just around the corner, but... That's a distortion. For some reason, people really don't understand what's happening. Protracted decline is occurring and people are absolutely blind to it. And it's because they aren't able to understand the time scale of what's happening. In Dark Age America, John Michael Greer suggests that children should be taught history by picking out one year and going through the events which occurred in that year Every week, at the, say at the end of the week, you'd go through what happened on April 20th, April 21st, April 22nd, April 23rd, April 24th, so on and so forth, right? And then when the kids would do that, they would see day to day, week to week, month to month, and finally the entire year, there wasn't that many big events, big events in huge historical terms, years like 1476 and or 476 and 1453 or 1991 are far in between and few. And that history moves very, very slowly and it's glacial. People think that history is just one big flashpoint and everything occurs very quickly. But now seeing this whole corona thing, it's readily apparent that even those flashpoints, those black uh, swan events, 
that occur, you know, every 20 years, every 30 years, every 50 years. They had decades of clear buildup. China has a long history of eating bushmeat. Wild animals, even endangered ones, are considered gourmet food and they're hunted and put into restaurants all over the board. And then they house them in basically these zoos where animals are, odd, bizarre animals are sitting right next to each other, right? And China's overpopulated. So the way that it's food processing plant is, is just going to lead to zoonosis. And also China's economy depends upon exports and foreign investors. At the same time, China is a single party state and it has a conformist culture that clenches down on any information coming out to the outside world. And, you know, part of that is the nature of the state, but part of that is the nature of its economy. They don't want investors to leave. So, the zoonosis won't be seen until months after it starts spreading of this novel disease, right? And then, there's an ever-increasing diaspora of Chinese people throughout the world. You know, students, uh, expats immigrants, so on and so forth, spreading throughout the world who come back in and out of China. So all these things are readily seen. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew that this is the set of circumstances which could lead to an international disease that spreads and becomes a pandemic. And what makes this even worse is this likeliness for the spread of novel diseases was even shown in 2000 three in 2004 in the first SARS epidemic. The dangers that the coronavirus could have both to people and to the world economy were fully illustrated. They could have, every single leader of the world saw what could have happened. Every single doctor, everybody knew this could happen. And indeed, even though it probably started happening in November, December, and it was spreading slowly throughout Wuhan, the, the, the people, the, Internationally, everybody was knowing what was going on from January, February, and they did nothing. It shows the extreme incompetence of this system, and this thing spread across the world, and it brought out all this impending consequences, and they did nothing. And just completely illustrated the frailty of our neoliberal world order through their grotesque incompetence. The radical right and left understand the frailty of the system and under various aspects and different angles, but seldom do they focus upon this frailty for long. It is novel to discover that the system will collapse and it will likely never recover at a certain point and ultimately, perhaps, it's too abstract and uninteresting for people. <laughs> That's the real irony to this. People instinctively believe in a final victory regardless of its likelihood it is necessary in order for somebody to maintain existential mental stability. Obscure ideologies such as anarchism and Nietzscheism, who've definitely seen the light of day and passed their prime, people still believe in them. People still believe in an ultimate victory. All the anarchists believe in the ultimate victory of anarchism, despite how absurd and minuscule their numbers are. <laughs> and every single religion, right? It triumphs in its eschatology, whether it be some fucking LARPin Cthulhu cult, whether it be Episcopalians and Unitarian Universalist, a world victory of liberalism or you know ufo cult that they're the only ones saved everyone's massacred or jesus comes back and any type of christianity right every single religion every single sect in its eschatology it wins same with every single ideology but the reality is actually quite grim there may there is no final victory at least in material terms from my point of view and i find any ability to prevent this final victory of the teleology of industrial progress is infinitesimal. Right now, right, we live in a world of 7.8 billion people, and it's always increasing, far beyond what could be sustained without industrial agriculture. 
Industrial agriculture requires the extensive use of fossil fuels, which are finite. Once they are gone, they're gone. The apparent solution is to replace them with what we tell to ourselves are not uh, non-renewable resources, these quasi-renewable resources or sustainable resources. Nuclear power, solar power, wind power, biomass even, tidal power, geothermal power. All these energies though are easy are harder to develop and they're harder to operate than fossil fuels. And even given the reality of global warming, some have much more severe externalities of pollution. At the same time, there is what we what I like to call peak human capital. Human biodiversity is real. Human intelligence is highly heritable and is not evenly distributed between groups including classical races. All people in industrial civilizations have taken on dysgenic characteristics. These include low birth rates, disparity in birth rates by intelligence, illegitimacy, widespread, the end of traditional monogamous marriage, and massive increases in abrosexuality. Western societies also are being replaced through aggressive, unseen immigration in the history of the world by almost always less capable groups. The development of these sustainable or renewable resources will become increasingly difficult as human capital diminishes and societies, beca <laughs> um, societies become first incapable of developing them then incapable of maintaining them, and finally even incapable of, argue, of operating the existing technologies. If we look at South Africa, they can't maintain the electric grid that the apartheid regime put up, right? There's brownouts throughout the entire third world all the time, and there's brownouts in California. We look at the United States, the United States doesn't build skyscrapers anymore and the skyscrapers it does are far less sophisticated than those it made before right the united states is no longer capable of reaching a space station and it possibly will no longer become a nuclear power because it has a trinium crisis and i mean look at brazil brazil has the third most amount of white people right of any country right beyond the united states and then russia but it's technological progress in a country like India, which has millions and millions and millions of people, millions of geniuses, despite how many intelligent people they have, the low level of average human capital takes down those intelligent people and drags them down and makes technological advance and sustainability less capable in those societies. And those are the real core problems which I believe make continued industrial civilization laughable. There is going to be a collapse. And once that collapse occurs, we took up all the easy fossil fuels, all the fossil fuels that remain, all the coal, all the natural gas, all the oil. They're hard stuff. When you start to get extracting car tar sands and getting oil rigs, if you went to a pre-industrial society, you can't come back to an industrial society anymore because the technology that you needed to do to get to Tarzans, you don't have the energy to get you that technology again. So once we collapse, once there is a global collapse of industrial civilization, that's it. No more industrialization. You never get back up industrializations over forever. And <clears throat> beyond those two core problems, there are problems which will make those problems much, much worse and are more likely the longer those core problems continue to get worse. Those first among them, nuclear proliferation, climate change, pollution through heavy metals and toxic radioactive substances, the rising acidity of the oceans, and novel diseases arising from zoonosis. And it will only become more severe as these two core problems get going on. As energy diminishes and people become more intel less intelligent as long as they have nuclear weapons, 
the use of nuclear weapons going off becomes more and more likely. Proliferation will become a bigger and bigger problem. You know, as we look at it now, when we're smart, nuclear power seems the best way out of this fossil fuel crisis. But if our dysgenics continue forever, nuclear power will become a millstone, which will drown us in an ocean of collapse and poison our earth irrevocably. The reality is that the civilization we live in, the global civilization, will decline and collapse as every civilization did before it. It is only a matter of time until our time is up.